I have a confession, you guys. At certain times in the past, I have been guilty of coming up short, shall we say, nearly achieving the finish line before petering out, working and straining to achieve the culmination of a task so I might experience that glorious, shuddering release of tension upon its completion, but no. Either through distraction or unforeseen mental flaccidity, I veer away from that promised climax and am ultimately left unsatisfied. Like when the Ryzen 5000 CPUs launched, I covered the 5900X, but I never really published a full review of the 5950X. Uh, the same goes for the 12700K and... Oh. What? Oh, uh, I, I was referring to my PC hardware reviews. Did you guys think I was talking about something else? I didn't think it was that suggestive. But anyway, no more to all of that, I say, for in today's video, I will finally publish my final mega review of the CPUs that launched in the past month that I didn't make videos on. The Ryzen 5 7600X and Ryzen 7 7700X from AMD and the Core i5 13600K and Core i5 13700K from Intel. I've been working to gather this data for so long, it's like a swollen reservoir of information just ready to burst. So sit back and relax while I fill you up with my seeds of knowledge. See, that was suggestive. Excellent! Today's video is brought to you by Kyoxia's ever-expanding family of high-performance SSDs, featuring their latest VIX 3D flash memory. The XG8 Client M.2 SSD is now available in capacities up to four terabytes with up to seven gigabytes per second sequential read speeds. And for enterprise or hyperscale data center use, consider the CD8, which supports PCI Express 5.0, or the XD7P, which leverages the thermal and performance benefits of the E1.S form factor, ideal for pairing with the latest AMD Epic or Intel Xeon server hardware. For more on Kyoxia SSDs, click the sponsor link in the video description. Right, so apart from that intro, I'd like this video to be mostly about the benchmark data, but I will quickly cover a few important notes for anyone considering a new CPU or a new PC build right now. First, if you want a recent CPU from the past one or two years, you basically have three platforms to choose from right now. AMD's AM4 platform, which is end of life now since the last hurrah 5800X 3D launched for that socket back in April. Here you'll find lower prices on slightly older motherboards and DDR4 memory, but still lots of gaming performance with the 5800X 3D, as well as the 12 and 16 core Ryzen 5000 CPUs. Then there's AMD's AM5 platform, which just launched in September, which should have more CPU families launching on it through 2025, as promised by AMD, providing future upgrade paths, but a combination of high higher Ryzen 7000 CPU prices and expensive 600 series motherboards, as well as the requirement to upgrade to DDR5 memory, has soured some builders on the first round of AM5 hardware, and there are likely Ryzen 7000 X3D CPUs coming early in 2023 that peak performance-oriented gamers are holding out for. Then there's Intel's LGA1700 platform, which launched in 2021 and now has two families of compatible CPUs, 12th Gen Alder Lake from last year, and now 13th Gen Raptor Lake CPUs that launched in October. Like AM4, we're not expecting another generation of CPUs from Intel on the LGA1700 platform, but there should be more 13th gen CPUs coming early in 2023 to provide more budget options below the $300 13600K. And for anyone on a more strict budget right now, there are good options available in AMD CPUs like the 5600 and 5600X paired with a B550 motherboard on AM4, or the Intel 12100 or 12400 paired with a B660 chipset motherboard, some of which can use DDR4 memory, which can keep costs down even further. Check out my builds video from earlier this week for a solid $750 gaming PC parts list. But for the rest of this video, we're focusing on the products that are newer, faster, and also a bit more pricey. So upwards of $1,200 dollars for a full system depending on the GPU that you would go with. And that ties in with my second point, which is to consider overall platform cost alongside the retail prices of these new CPUs. Builders will need a new motherboard and DDR5 memory kit if they want what's new and fresh, but balance the appeal of the new shiny stuff with the practicality of some of the deals you can find right now on hardware that's only a year or two old. Thirdly, I made a mistake that I need to correct, or perhaps Nvidia tricked me if you're feeling generous. Basically, there was a driver up update alongside the RTX 4090 launch, which came before the Intel 13th gen CPU launch, but after the Ryzen 7000s. And that update significantly improved DirectX 12 gaming performance for RTX 30 series cards, like the MSI Supreme RTX 3090 Ti that I used for testing. So in my 13900K review, most of the CPUs were game tested with the older driver version 516.94, and the 13900K and 7900X got a modest performance improvement by using driver version 522.25. 
thankfully the impact on overall results was minimal and my conclusions remain the same, but I have rerun the impacted game tests so all CPUs shown today are on equal footing. And here are the four CPUs I am adding to the mix today to complete the lineups from AMD and Intel. The Intel Core i5-13600K now has double the E-cores versus the 12600K, eight of them giving it 20 threads total, which is more than the 7600X from AMD, albeit in a different core count configuration. It has also been spotted for $300 at retail recently, down from $330 initially, a price that I hope holds to put more pressure on AMD's 7600X. The 13700K is Intel's middle child, which was not widely sampled to media, I'm not sure why, so I just bought this one, but at $450 it sits in the gap between AMD's 7700X and 7900X. It has also dropped in price just a little bit in the past week, I've been seeing it for $440 bucks versus $450, and it has 24 compute threads just like the $550 7900X and some impressive gaming performance to boot. For AMD we're adding the 8 core 16 thread 7700X, which peaks at 5.4 GHz on paper, but actually pushed to 5.5 GHz during my testing. It's a 1 CCD chip like the 7600X, which keeps the TDP and temperatures down somewhat and makes a strong case for CPU efficiency. And finally we have the Ryzen 9 7900X, with two CCDs, 12 cores, and 24 threads, as well as a $550 price, placing it right between the 13700K and 13900K. In the past, the 12-core Ryzen was a big step up from the 8-core while offering a big discount versus the 16-core, but with so much competition from Intel this time around, the 7900X seems to be having a harder time standing out. With all that said, I have a basket full of benchmarks to share with you, so I'll just point out that all my test beds, comparison hardware methodologies, and settings, except for the GPU driver, are the same as in my Ryzen 7950X and Intel 13900K reviews, so please check those videos out if you'd like some more details. The specs of my testbed setup can be seen on screen now, but I will highlight the important parts. For DDR5 platforms, I'm using two 32GB G-Skill memory kits, a Trident Z5 Neo kit with Expo settings for AM5, and their closest equivalent XMP settings kit for Intel, which is a Trident Z5 RGB kit. Both are rated for DDR5 6000 speed and CL30 timings. For the GPU, I'm using the MSI Supreme X version of NVIDIA's RTX 3090 Ti, and for the CPU cooler, we have a 360mm AIO, the Corsair H150i Elite LCD. The systems were set up in open test beds with radiator fans pushing air across the motherboard CPU socket and VRMs for consistency. And now let's go over performance. Here are the frequencies or clock speeds that each CPU was running at. I'm showing the peak frequency each CPU hit across all tests, as well as the sustained all-core frequency during a 10-minute IDA64 stress test. CPU temperatures are closely connected to this chart, and both motherboards are set to cap performance based on peak temperatures rather than power, but only the 13900K actually hit 100 degrees Celsius during the stress test, which resulted in slightly lower average clock speeds. It's cool that all seven of the new CPUs are running at between 5.1 and 5.8 GHz though, even with all cores loaded up with the stress test. Here are my temperature comparisons showing the average core temperature after the 10 minute IDA64 burn-in test, and again a reminder that with the motherboard settings I'm using, which are default for many models, both families of CPUs will push performance until they hit a thermal threshold. AMD's max temp for the 7000 series at 95C is a little bit lower than Intel's at 100 but only the 13900K and 7950X actually bumped up against those limits. Both Intel and AMD motherboards offer settings that can dial back both power usage and the resulting temperatures, such as the PBO undervolt method that I used in my 7600X video, so don't despair and think that you'll need a $200 liquid cooler to use these chips. You can get by with less. And yes, the 13600K ran a bit hotter than the 13700K in my tests, although on average it was just a 4 degree difference. And here are my power draw results, I'm showing three measurements the typical wattage drawn by the entire system during the Blender open data render, the peak CPU package power draw as reported by Hardware Info, and the peak CPU package power draw while gaming, specifically with 3D Mark times by Extreme. At the top of the chart, you'll probably note that the 13700K and 13600K are remarkably less power hungry than the 13900K, pulling about 100 watts less. And then further down, you might also note that the 7700X and 7900X are also quite power efficient thanks to that TSMC 5 nanometer lithography using 150 and 200 watts peak package power respectively versus the Intel chips at 220 and 250 watts. For some, efficiency is less of a concern and performance is king, but for anyone who is concerned about 
heat output during the summer months or their power bill, the Ryzen 7000 family has a significant leg up over Intel. And now it's time for the benchmarks, starting with Cinebench R23 using all cores and threads. I color coded the bars by manufacturer this time, by the way, as several commenters have requested. Not sure if that's AMD red, but it's close enough. The 13700K scored 30,472, about 4.5% faster than the 7900X, while the 13600K was 21% faster than the 7700X and 59% in front of the 7600X. And here are the single thread scores, an area that Intel remains competitive in, with the 13700K scoring 2,089 points, which even beats the 7950X. It was also 4% faster than the 7900X, while the 13600K was 4.1% faster than the 7600X, and right about even with the 7700X. CPU Mark is part of the Passmark Performance Test 10.2 suite and runs a series of synthetic workloads to determine overall performance. Like Cinebench, multi-threaded scores leverage all the cores and threads available, and in this test, the 13700K couldn't beat the 7900X's score of 53,066 points. It was 6.8% slower, but the 13600K has another couple wins, coming in 6.6% ahead of the 7700X and 36% in front of the 7600X. In the CPU Mark single-threaded test, the 13700K again outperforms all comers except the 13900K. The Ryzen 7000s all had strong showings to place in the top seven, with the 13600K coming in just 1-2% to behind with a score of 4243. Blender 3.3 is next, which is a free and open source 3D creation suite for modeling, animation, simulation, and rendering. The open data version 3.1 test provides a samples per minute score across three test scenes, Monster, Junk Shop, and Classroom. The 7900X had a strong showing with a score of 464, putting the 13700K about 2.5% behind, and the 13600K puts up a good fight again, leaving the 7700X and 7600X in the dust, and even surpassing the 24-thread 5900X from last gen. We have a couple entries from the Adobe suite next, starting with Photoshop, and I'm testing the 2022 version with the Puget Systems benchmark extension. The 13700K once again shows it can easily keep up with the $550 7900X and $700 7950X, although the 13600K K struggles a bit more, landing 5.5% behind the 7700X and 4.4% short of the 7600X. Here's Adobe Premiere Pro 2022 for the video editors out there, also testing with the Puget Systems benchmark extension, and once again the 13700K pushed past the 7900X, although it was just a 7 point win. The 13600K meanwhile bounces back from the Photoshop loss to beat both the 7600X by 15% and the 7700X by 7%. Next we have video transcoding via handbrake, processing a 150 megabit H.264 4K video down to 1080p with the fast preset. The encoding speed is shown as a frame rate, and the 13700K has once again embarrassed embarrassed the 7900X by completing the transcode in 134.1 seconds, a 5.4% victory. Likewise, the 13600K is making use of those extra E-cores to take 6th place in handbrake, beating out the 7700X by 13.2% and the 7600X by 39%. Moving on, we have V-Ray, which is a software solution by Chaos Group that helps artists and designers create photoreal imagery and animations. Their benchmark is measured in V-samples, and here's another test where AMD excels. The 7900X's score of 22,238 allows it to stay on top of the 13700K, which was about 6.5% slower. The 13600K holds strong though in another route versus the 7700X and the 7600X. The Corona renderer is a modern high performance photorealistic renderer available standalone or as a plugin for 3D Studio Max or Cinema 4D, and we're looking at time to render so lower is better. The 13700K and 7900X are dead even here, completing the render in 48 seconds on average, while the 6 and 8 core CPUs struggle to keep up. Rounding out our compute tests, we have 7-Zip testing basic file compression and decompression using the 32 megabyte dictionary size setting. For compression, the 13900K can't be beat, but the 13700K sits comfortably between the 7950X and 7900X, while the 13600K leads the lower half of the pack yet again. For decompression, the Ryzen chips still dominate. The 7950X's score of 263,970 MIPS remains untouchable, and the 13700K falls below the 7900X and 5900X. The 7700X also surpasses the 13600K for about a 6% win. Now let's check out a batch of gaming benchmarks to see if the 13 13700K and 13600K can take on the Ryzen 7000 CPUs or the 5800X 3D, which specializes in peak gaming performance. I'm running all the games except 3D Mark at 1080p, a relatively lower resolution where CPU performance will make more of a difference in the frame rates we achieve. And for the GPU, we're running a factory overclocked MSI Supreme X variant of NVIDIA's RTX 3090 Ti. 
3D Mark times by Xtreme is a synthetic benchmark from 3D Mark. It's a DirectX 12 test, and here the 3090 Ti's graphics score does not fluctuate much between CPUs, although the 7700X was able to eke out a few extra points versus the competition. The CPU test is a better comparison, which is what these results are sorted by, and here the 13700K was 2.6% faster than the 7900X, while the 13600K beats the 7700X and 7600X by 16.4 and 55.4% respectively. Meanwhile, Shadow of the Tomb Raider is running in DirectX 12 mode, and here the 3D vCache enabled 5800X 3D is holding strong, hitting 275.4 FPS, which was 2.5% faster than even the 13900K. The 13700K is uncomfortably close to the 7950X at the same time, while also sporting improved 1% lows, and the 1300K and 7700X are neck and neck. Horizon Zero Dawn is next, using the favorite quality preset and allowing the AMD chips to run away with multiple victories. The Ryzen 7000 CPUs just tend to dominate in this title, leaving all of Team Blue's CPUs in the lower half of the chart. Good thing I tested multiple games, though because as you can see with Cyberpunk 2077, Intel wins some too. I'm using the Ultra preset and I found these results satisfying because of the grouping. 13th gen Intel, then Ryzen 7000, then 12th gen Intel, then Ryzen 5000. A good chart to show off my color coding and even the 13600K is 12 to 13% ahead of the 7600X and 7700X. Civilization VI performance was tested with the Gathering Storm AI benchmark where CPU capabilities are determined by AI turn time rather than how many frames it can squeeze out of our RTX 3090 Ti. The 7900X, 7700X, and 7600X all had good showings, but the 13700K managed to squeeze squeeze into the middle of the Ryzen 7000 pack with an average turn time of 25.1 seconds, the 13600K is not far behind either. Rounding things out with Far Cry 6, and here the 13700K manages a healthy win, even surpassing the 5800X 3D, which was the former champ in this test before the 13th gen Intel CPUs launched. The 13600K is again not far behind though, sneaking in between the 7950X and 7900X for a strong showing in our final gaming test. And now for the best part of my benchmark review videos where I boil days of work down to a few summary comparisons. But a warning to those who skipped ahead to this part, your shoes are untied. It's very dangerous. Here are my aggregate scores across all tests, though, starting with compute performance. I'm using the 12600K as the 100% baseline here to represent last gen performance at just shy of $300. And based on these results, the 13600K is about 29% faster for CPU number crunching tasks. That's a big boost and similar to the 13900K's improvements over the 12900K, but consider the other CPUs that the 13600K is outperforming here, the 5900X, 12700K and even the 7700X were all 5 to 10% slower, and those all cost well over $300. I am impressed with the 13600K. The 13700K too, 55% better than the 12600K, a healthy bump versus the 12700K, and beating out the 5950X for 440 bucks. Yes, the 7900X did edge it out by three points or so, but keep in mind that the Ryzen CPU costs $100 more. Overall, I must credit Intel with shipping CPUs that are either outperforming AMD outright or offering just slightly less performance for a much better price. Let's take a look at those same values just resorted by gaming performance, and here we can see a cutoff between last gen and current gen just below that 13600K, with the only outlier being the 5800X 3D, which clearly has a price to performance edge for gaming focused builds. That said, all of these CPUs offer excellent gaming performance, particularly when you consider that I am testing at the lower 1080p resolution where performance between CPUs is exaggerated. The 13900K is on top for now, but every CPU that I'm highlighting today was 10 to 14% faster than the 12600K for gaming, so I think your decision should be based on how much compute performance that you need, possibly seasoned with your concerns or lack thereof when it comes to efficiency, and of course, most significantly, the price. So here's a final chart with current pricing as well, so we can look at it all on one page. I am using the retail price for existing CPUs, not MSRP, and for the 13th gen Intel CPUs, there are some recent sales that aren't reflected here, like the 13600K going for 300 bucks or the 13700K at 440. The 13600K indeed puts the screws to both the 7600X and the 7700X, especially if it's 300 bucks, providing just slightly less gaming performance, but a notable improvement in compute chops. The 13700K, meanwhile, is really making the 7900X look like a bad deal, and this isn't even 
been accounting for most X670 motherboards going for 50 to 100 bucks more than comparable LGA 1700 solutions right now. But then the 5800X3D is there, asking you why you need to even bother with these new pricey platforms when it is all you really need for gaming, especially if you can catch one of those fire sales that bring it down to $330 or so. But what can I say to wrap up? I am very glad I made this video because taking a more complete look at the landscape has been pretty eye-opening. AMD and Intel have really flip-flopped in terms of what they're offering consumers, with AMD's new chips feeling overpriced for the performance they can muster and probably leaning too heavily on that efficiency win to justify what they're charging. Intel, meanwhile, has managed some significant performance gains over their 12th gen chips, while also pricing their CPUs quite competitively versus Ryzen 7000, giving you more compute performance or better pricing at pretty much every level, which is pretty much exactly what AMD did with the first few generations of Ryzen on AM4. If you're considering a new PC build and you're going to be spending upwards of $1,200 and you're at all interested in compute performance alongside gaming, the 13600K and 13700K would get my nod over these 76. 700X, 7700X, or 7900X at their current prices. If all you do is gaming, then the 5800X 3D is probably a more budget-friendly choice, or perhaps consider waiting two to three months for the Ryzen 7000 X 3D chips to debut, but we don't know what SKUs they have in the pipeline or how much they'll cost. And if anyone from AMD is watching this, you guys really need to work with motherboard manufacturers to get B650 pricing down. Even if you don't hit that $125 price that was promised, a few solid choices for B650 or B650 e boards in the $150 to $170 range would make recommending Ryzen 7000 series CPUs much easier to do. CPU sales wouldn't hurt either. Remember when you guys used to do that? Look, Intel's already doing it, but okay. That's all I have to say on these new CPUs and platforms for now, probably until January when another batch is expected to debut. Closing things to say, hit the thumbs up button on your way out if you enjoyed this video. Check out my store at paulshardware.net for shirts, mugs, other cool stuff you can buy, including my new 8-bit designs, which are really cool. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and stay tuned for lots more content coming soon. We'll see you all in the next video.